So, welcome to a Monday evening. I really love guitars and um, free myself from the power cable. Here we have Robert's V100, vintage V100. A nice, good quality Les Paul copy from the John Hornby Skews JHS family of brands who make vintage and encore and fret king and probably some other ones I can't remember right now. Gra uh, gra graph tech, no, um, music tech, music tech, something like that. Um, anyway, make a lot of stuff and actually pretty good stuff as well. Robert's had this, I think, for about eight years and never had it set up and, and never really had it playing the way he wants it to play. And I think ill health is making playing difficult as well. So he wants a guitar that's really light and easy to play. So the aim of this will be to uh, give it a, a low light setup um, or low light action and fit a an adjustable tusk nut and um, get it playing as easy as possible for his hands his joints um, so we'll get rid of that nut horrible plastic thing uh, and we'll replace it with a 3d base and adjustable nut unit these pickups are pretty good they're I've, I've always liked the Wilkinson humbuckers. They seem to be pretty capable. Um, everything else on here looks sort of good shape. Um, I'm short of 10 gauge strings at the moment, so I'm going to be uh, waiting for some to come in in the next couple of days. But so this won't go out until then. Excuse me, just plugging the power in. We're still running, jolly good. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, just going to take a couple of measurements my own interest um, I, I want Robert one of the things he asked me today in an email was you know can I improve on the action for him um, and my kind of instinct is to say yes I can but I can't be a hundred percent sure of that uh, but certainly not without knowing what the action currently is so let's look down at the last fret we've got I would say we've got um, 1.5 and two so i bet we'll run into some problems here now with the um the frets so high e just about two millimeters last fret low e 1.5 millimeters last fret so a sort of quick estimate of the uh neck relief that's about 0.5 i think that's quite a lot take that down a bit what I'll do is I'll just I'll just be sure of that while we're at it sorry about the view I'm doing a quick whiz around um, I just uh, just finished a setup on Rich's um, Yamaha Pacifica which I upgraded with new pickups and uh, of course I went and put them in and found out after the fact that they were in fact uh, the, the bridge pickup was how to phase with the, the other two, Seymour Duncan and Iron Gear. So I had to go back in and make a change, which was annoying, but anyway. Yeah, it's about 0.5. It's not a bad guess, actually, thankfully. 0.5. That way you can bring that down a bit. Uh, and what have we got on the, sorry about my wires. What can I say? Oh, I wish I had a mirror on here. That would be so useful because then I could just look at that and go, hey, do that. That's what I'm going to have to do. Stick a mirror. Sorry, Sony view. I'm going to have a stick a mirror on the board there. One at each end so I can see what I'm looking at at the business end. Right. So uh, action down here. Yeah, that's high. Um, see what it is. Yeah, I reckon, what do I reckon that's? I'm going to reckon that's about seven here. Could be wrong though. That's a bit, that's a bit unfair. No, I'm right, seven. So, uh, high E, first fret action, 0.7. Uh, I mean, we'll just get rid of that, but that's one of the reasons why this will, be, will have been difficult to play. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and find me where I put the adjustable nuts. 
uh, actually, I may as well be reaching the point where I'm almost out of these little beauties. So um, I'm going to have to make myself get one ordered. One here. I've got one there. Oh, there's two. Right, I've, I've made some originally, originally already, and set them in resin. But I'm going to use. I'm not going to use resin for this. I'm going to use um, whatever that stuff is. Um, the stuff is 3D printed base. So I'm having to sort of wind these out of the resin bases. They're, they're good. I'll use possibly use them in future. But for the time being, that's the device we need. And um, along with one of these little things, which I'll now cut out. Now, these were made for me by Gerard, who has been working with me to um, create some 3D printed uh, nut bases, which has been a great help. And I think we're, we're nearly there. We've just got a couple of tweaks to do, but once we're there, it'll save me uh, an hour or so of hard work on each one, which is which is a, a no end of a boon for me. Um, anyway, so what am I gonna do? Okay, let's keep this focused on that end as good as we can. So, ooh, see, this scrapes around and is trying to, um, scratch the headstock as it goes around so it's not a good stringing technique uh, Robert when you come to see this um, when you get towards the end of this video one of the things I'll do is you'll see me going on quite a bit about the tuning stability and and how to string the um, how to string the guitar and stretch out the slack to give you perfectly good tuning stability um, now the reason why I've always focused so much on the nut is because the nut plays a critical part in the playability of the guitar and the tuning of the guitar. It playability-wise, um, and a first fret, oh, that's interesting, that's had two different covers on it. Um, a first fret action of over about 0.5 of a millimeter um, makes notes played down at that end go sharp. Um, whether you like it or not, it's it, it's a dynamic of the, of the height of the, string above the first fret. This is now putting up a bit of a fight. Wow. And this has been glued on well hard. There's nothing I can do but fight to get it off. Um, yeah, so above 0.5 of a millimeter, um, you get notes playing sharp when you fret them near the nut. And it, it's typically, you, you, you'll notice it when this is well and truly glued. Yuck. Um, e. Okay, let's see what they've done is they've, they've, they've finished right the way up to there. Oh my lordy. That's a, that is, that is a, a, a grim mess. Um, yeah, so typically what happens is you get um, you get the, if they're too high, the notes go sharp, and then you play a note, and your um, your your held strings, like in a D chord, are out of tune, but your open strings are in tune, and that is uh, an unpleasant and unholy mess. Now, I've got to try and get this. Excuse me a second. Try and get this nut out of here because it's, it's. I see what it's done. It's stuck to the bloody finish. Uh, Look at this. Oh, what a mess. Oh, that's horrible. That's actually lifting the um, it's lifting the uh, finish off of here because it's it's so solidly glued to the front of this. Um, right, I'm going to have to I'm gonna to have to sorry and the angle's not good, but I'm gonna to have to try and crack this seal because Otherwise, it's never going to come out. 
where it's going to come out. And unfortunately, I think it's going to take a great big, I'm just going to try and take a great big piece of headstock with it. As it is, I'm still probably going to have to do some gluing and some, uh, re maybe even some refinishing. This is, God, what did they spray all the way up here for? That is unbelievable. <laughs> I have not seen one like this before. This is an absolute stinking mess. That is that is so firmly glued to the, uh, to the front of this nut. And there's almost, I can't really see any way of doing it other than cutting it away, but that's going to leave a big hole anyway. Um, so I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to cut it out anyway. Thanks, John Hornby Skews. I can't even get into it. I can hear it crunching. Ugh. Fingers clear. Did they do that? Um, I actually can't get any further into there without sort of cutting down into it. That is the worst stuck, the most stuck piece of um, plastic I have ever come across. That's horrible. So just coming back to this, it's, it does not want to lift up. So what I've got is I've got a, a situation now with, uh, it's lifted the finish, it's, it's split the finish and it's trying to lift it off the front of here. So I'm going to have to glue it down and um, sand back and refinish over the top of it. So it's going to, I mean, it's lucky we're not in a rush. Sorry about this, but that's made an absolute pain in the, what's it? Still doesn't want to come off. Look at that. That is firm, firmer than you could imagine. My, my real worry is what, unless I'm going to, right, I'm going to have to clamp this down to remove this because it's trying to lift off the paintwork off the front of the headstock. God, I'm going to stay at these. What did I say about the vintage V100? Good thing, didn't I say? This tuna is falling apart as well. I think we might, we might be in for a set of tuners at this point. Oh dear. They're all falling apart. <laughs> uh, I've had a spate recently of guitars that as soon as I touched them or did one thing, look at this, did anything to them, they just went all over the place. Every every step of the way, it got worse and worse. I have a feeling I'm in that zone right now. Yeah, I think these are going to come off and get replaced. Uh, certainly, that's what I'm going to recommend. Um because there's no point playing with something that, that's terrible. So I'm gonna get all of this off. I'm gonna clamp down this piece of finish so it can't lift any further. And then I'll get this damned nut off. And then the next stage will be to glue down, uh, glue back down the lifting finish. Um, and then we may have to Oh, the state of those tuners. It's, I've never seen such bad tuners. Um, and that's been, that's been tied down as well, which is an absolute no-no in my book. Please don't do that to your strings. Right. Yeah, feel that lifting. These, these are just something else. So what I thought for a minute was going to be an easy job has suddenly just turned into uh, a world of pain, I'm sorry to say. 
just taking all the sort of loose hardware for a second out of the way. Um, I think we're going to need to get <sighs> honestly. I might just effort my imagination for bits falling off this. <laughs> I mean, broken bits. Right. These are rattly as hell. I think maybe part of the problem on here might be, uh, might just be that these, these um, have got the wrong size bushes in them. So maybe somebody's upgraded them in the past. Right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all these off because I'm going to need to, I think by the that, I'm gonna need to refinish the front of this headstock. This is doing my head in. <laughs> and I think we may have to examine these bushes or the ferals that came out because I've got a feeling that they are the wrong size. This is why everything's wobbling so much. But that doesn't help the tuning. It doesn't help the process of tuning any. Um, so you've got a real challenge. You can see that, oh, come on. You can see that the, um, that the uh, nut wasn't gonna come off. Um, and you have to hit it to break that glue seal because you can't get a knife behind it. Um, and then if it's, prone to, no, that's not coming out, why isn't that coming out? If it's prone to, um, if it's gonna tear or snap, then it's gonna do it. And the only thing I'm grateful for or pleased about is that it's happened at a time where I'm probably best kitted out to uh, refinish the front of it without too much misery. I've got some good clear finish and a good sprayer. Um, so I can get down to that, but I'm going to have to do a gluing and the touching up where the finish is cracked. But before all of that, I'm going to need to put something in here and clamp this together so I can get this accursed thing off because there's no way this damn thing wants to come off without tearing a great big chunk of everything with it. I mean, no matter how much I dig into here, it's still doesn't appear to want to do it. And I can keep on, keep on cutting. I don't want to rip holes in the shelf that the nut sits on. But in a way, that's a sort of slightly secondary concern right now. See, it's trying to, it's trying to lift that whole piece up. Uh, I'm going to have to lock this down with a piece of wood and find a way to, um, to break it off. Uh, maybe this would work better. Hmm. So if I clamp there, will I be able to get anything under there? No, that's not the right shape for clamping. That's the problem. Tricky. Tricky. Just what you need at bank. Nine o'clock on a Monday night. Uh, probably just get that. No. We need to. My concern is that I don't really think we can get anything to hold that down. We would have to. We'd have to get some. Sorry about the view. Uh, that just about holds it there. Oh, great, it's flaked right off there. Fantastic. God oh, almighty. Well, I didn't expect any of that. Um, I mean, I guess I can do that, but then I can't really get into there very easily. 
Let's see if I can hold that down and tap it. <clears throat> so there'll be a bit of repairing going on, I think, at this rate. So let's put put some a little bit of weight onto there. I can't get that is unbelievable. I have never experienced a nut like this before. Never seen a nut like this before. Uh, See, it's chipped a bit off there and it's still refusing to come out. Ay, ay, ay. I'll just keep on trying to cut my way down, but. Oh, look at that, look. Oh, what an absolute. See, it's lifting, still lifting, even though it's. It's cut free because it's lifting the wood. That's what's happened. The wood split. It's not the finish. It's the bloody wood. They've glued it on with so much glue. Oh, Christ. Well, this is a this is an example of somewhere where you literally there's nothing you can do about this that is glued on so extremely. Uh, nothing's going to get it off. It's, I'm cutting at the front thinking it's the, it's the front, but it's, it's the, what it is, it's the wood. It's, it's glued rock solid to the wood and it's lifting, it's splitting, it's splitting the wood of the shelf and taking this finish with it. Uh, anyway, it's going to, it's going to at some point just snap off. I can't get anything underneath it because it's got a load of wood attached to it. Um, I think the only thing I am going to be able to do is cut down through the wood. Uh, I didn't expect to have to do that. Um, it's not a great look, I'm afraid. Ugh. It feels like a kind of savagery. Oh, look at that. There goes the finish. Jesus wept. Still attached. That's how deeply attached this is, how firmly attached this is. Oh, never seen anything like this before. Oh, look at that. What an absolute pig's ass that is. Oh, well, that's kind of created me some fun and games now. Thanks a bunch. Uh, I mean, this, this is a glassy finish here. It's really glassy. Well, I've got some, I've got some um, fill and finish that I can build it up with, but. Oh, what a, I mean, what a stinking mess at the amount of material that's taken out. Christ almighty. I mean, it's made a huge cavity that I'm going to have to fill in order to get a nut base onto there properly. I mean, maybe I can, I can some way I can lever this out. Well, anyway, look, there you go. There's a, there's a, a nightmare horror story for you. So my, my, my kind of, um, I don't know what the word would be, my, Remedial brain is now firing on all cylinders, trying to figure out what am I going to do to, to repair this. Uh, actually, I'm not even going to start with this because one of the things that I'll be facing is getting glue under there to get this flaked wood back in order and stuck down. <clears throat> I mean, there's some little flakes there coming off. So that actually, the God, the amount of finish that's coming off there is just crazy. Uh, hmm. So I've got I've got a load of things to do here. I've got to get glue under there, clamp that down. <clears throat> I've got to touch up any brake lines in there. I've got to build up the finish there with some clear coat. Fill and finish, smooth it off, mask everything off, spray over the headstock. So 
doable. Um, and I'm just trying to work out, would I be able to recover this, these two pieces of wood from here? Chances, and chances out of 10 of getting these things off in one piece to, to refinish them. Uh, could I put them in there and sand back? Can I start by, no, if I put that in there, even if I cut this down, I still can't remove this well enough. It would be better off filling that with a, a wood filler or a, not wood filler, um, a sort of auto weld substance. Uh, but I'll, I'll off camera, I'll have a go at see if I can get these two pieces out because to be able to stick them back in and fill these gaps would be a good start. Um, but I, as I say, I've got a, a big kind of, I've got to prise this open, get glue into there as well. But, you know, re refinish on here, I would say so. I would rather do that and have this glued down and smooth and finished. And I'm not worried about that. It's just a little bit of extra time and stuff, but it's it's depressing. That's the worst, the worst nut I have ever come across. Just as it was all looking good to get set up to um, fit a nice custom nut. Damnation. So that's one of the reasons why when I put a nut on, I try to use as little glue as is humanly possible because quite frankly, that's what happens if you don't. All right, I'm gonna stop now because I've got loads of little fiddly things to do all off camera, see what I can achieve. Okay, just a quick um, catch up. I've managed to insert the, I can't really see it, but I managed to insert most of those divots of wood back in. So I've kind of built up mostly built up the missing bits on the shelf. It'll make it easier to fill. I've discovered another thing. These are completely the wrong size, which is why the tuners were leaning over, which has probably done no good to the gearing. But beyond that, what I've got, I've done is I've um, prized, gently prized open the split um, and got glue into both sides, very runny glue into both sides. I can't see it very well. And I've clamped, um, I've clamped down, uh, to keep the finish flat. Um, now that is, uh, it's gonna stick the paper to it, I know that, and it's going to um, have glue over spill, and I know that too, but as long as it's confined to the front, then I am prepared to sand that back and um, you know get take off some of this finish and then respray over the top of that. So it's the best way forward for this. I'm quite happy, I'm gonna leave it there and leave this set in its own time. Um, we'll just call it quits for now, but that, that is a, I have to say that's, that's, that's probably, where's it gone? There it is. That's the nastiest surprise, uh, unpleasant surprise. You can see I didn't quite get all of that off, but I got, um, I got the, most of the underside part, which fitted it back into the hole quite nicely. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the least pleasant surprise I've had from a guitar in a long time. Um, I, there's no doubt I'll be able to, you know, get it done and working um it's just it's going to be several hours of uh time and effort that i won't be able to charge for and i wasn't anticipating so there you go but you know as always go straight into damage limitation mode as soon as something doesn't work out all right that's it for now i'll uh, come back to you when we um when we look at this uh one of these things i'm beginning to wonder whether if I'm going to put the headstock at some point through the buffer, then maybe I'd put the whole guitar through the buffer as well. But that would mean taking all the hardware and stuff out. Um, but you know, if it's going to be here for another week and I'm going to be focusing on this bit, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, Ooh, welcome back. Well, after a bit of a detour to repair the he uh, headstock that went for a bit of a splitting walk, uh, you can see we have a freshly sprayed and buffed out headstock ready for new tuners. So I'm just gonna put you over there, you walking camera you. And don't forget, of course, I've got my uh, my view, which is there, my mirror view. Oh, we've got no lights on. Yeah. Well, that's a pleasant evening. Should we just do it without lights? Let's do it without lights for a change. Different um, quality. Okay, so what I'm just gonna grab is the Mm, those things, the whatever the word is, that thing, the thing. 
can see what the fit is like here. So you've got lovely new gold tunars which arrive, that's great. And of course, knowing my luck, they won't fit straight away. So the first thing I'm gonna to need to do whilst adjusting the view to there is to ream as much as possible. I thought I'd already done this, but perhaps I had not. Maybe I didn't at all, actually. So, oh well, no big deal. Time to do it, nonetheless. Let's just try for the fit, just about. Okay. So we kind of know where the fit is on this reaming tool. So it's quite low, low down. So we have to get a good dig in before we're going to get the new tuners to fit. Going up from uh, an eight millimeter hole to a ten. So it's quite a big bite, quite a big difference. So since the last time we spoke, um, yes, I've been in the hammock, so I've got a bit of sun. Believe it or not, it was warm enough to do that. Um, but I've been a slow process of respraying and fixing this damage as a result of the nut pulling up a great flap of the headstock with it unfortunately. Um, just one of those things. I, you know, thought about it at the time. I thought, well, you know, it literally is the only time in about, who knows, six, seven hundred guitars like this, the only time that's ever happened. Um, so just extremely bad luck. Um, you know, some folks said things like, oh, well, I always cut the nuts in half long ways before I remove them and the thing is I get that I do that when I have a, a an iffy looking uh, strap or telly nut which I can feel isn't moving and it's a it's a very smart thing to do to then uh, don't take the risk of breaking the, the timber behind the nut which is a very real possibility with a strap or a telly so the deal is that you cut it long ways um, and kind of tap it inwards to break it, break the nut off without putting any force on the wood behind the, um, behind the, what am I looking for, the word? Wood behind the nut. That's what you don't want to do. Let's have a feel. Jolly good, in we go. Um, anyway, but it, it's not, it's not something I've ever had to do with those pulls, so. Um, I got unlucky, I think, and I think the grain of the wood where the nut uh, finished, well, where the nut, where the finish stuck to the nut, I should say, um, that sort of helped to splinter the grain away or pull away the uh, the, the wood. So um, I think it's a combination, an unlucky combination of glue problem and. Um, finish problem because the finish sometimes they finish right up to the edge of the uh, the nut and that can become a, a kind of glue that sticks the nut in place now that's if that happens it that combined with too much glue leaves you with a, a real problem um, still anyhow we shall move onwards having managed to stick it back together again followed by cleaning it up sanding it back refinishing it with clear poly and this is good for me because it's the first time i've sprayed clear poly uh, using this uh, my particular finish um, apollo spraying device high volume low pressure sprayer which is quite a good first um i've, I've done some test shooting and stuff like that but this is the first time i've used it on a, in anger should we call it um, and it's gone on very well I'm still doing some experiments right at this moment in time with different um, paints and stuff um, and I have a feeling that for the short term I'm going to probably end up sticking to car paints for the colors when I make guitars and um, I think I'll probably use the carry on using the Morels clear finish for the clear coat because they seem to be getting a good result with that so i'm pleased with that um so 
just these are going on great. They look fab. Um, one of the reasons I think I mentioned to Robert on in an email, I said that they he had a problem with the original tuners leaning forward too far, which was possibly causing gearing problems. Um, and he at that point he remembered that he'd changed them over, um, and I think hadn't uh, had not noticed that the bushing was different so ended up with the wrong size bushing on there so this is a good um, upgrade i think 19 to 1 uh, wilkinson tuner which is going to give a much much smoother tuning experience um, which is going to be confidence inspiring hey, look at that delicious as far as the repairs go there was a big chip on the end of the a cracked chip i suppose you could say on the end of the nut here and i've filled that the best of my ability um, but in sanding it back it took a tiny bit of the color away it's very very difficult when you fill something and then you color it to sand it back without scuffing a bit of the color off um, in the process and and it's quite difficult because if you do that and then you have to sort of go backwards and respray color and then respray more clear over the top um it's not necessarily a very good way around it so i think it's i'm gonna leave it where it is it's an it's not a bad repair uh, and it's it's you can't it's not gonna obstruct um it's not gonna not gonna feel it it's not gonna be a bad feeling thing okay so finally we're back where we were about several hours ago with it look how brand new nut about to go in place now what have we learned about nuts oh yes don't stick them in with too much glue well of course we won't but i will hold this down with a tiny dab of glue um, i'm just going to clean up got a bit of the buffer uh, compound on the end there which i just want to clean off before i um, stick anything down there we go so I will apply this with a little bit of glue. This glue will hold, the purpose of this glue will be to hold this base in place here. And actually that kind of sticks in perfectly well there. So probably might not even need it, but I'm going to do it anyway, just for that little extra bit of stability. Uh, some, I saw some nuts made for Gibsons the other day. Um, I don't know if they were acoustic nuts or... Uh, electric ones but they had a little dimple at the bottom where I presume you would either make or have already but possibly drill your own little locator lug um, which is a good idea I think to avoid having to use glue um, so you end up with the, the nut staying in place where you want it to be so I'm going to do a little tiny patch at either end and then I'm going to kind of push it into place so it goes exactly where I want it. There we have it exactly where I want it, which is there. Push it down and we are done. The new nut in place, hurrah. Now, is it, like I said, there's tiny little um, bits of cut through there, um, which I could touch up with a, a single marker pen and you probably never even notice it, but it's just one of those things. Okay, so that's the new nut on and we're, sort of ready to go with the old strings the old bridge the old stop bar and all of that stuff because now is the time to uh, get lined up too oh i was going to take sorry you're not looking in the right direction but i was going to take off the pit guard to allow me to just clean up under there when the time is right um yeah so so we look down this way Sorry, and I've got this thing where now I'm, I'm not even sure that I haven't got the camera in the way of the thing. Something like that. Okay. Hello, everybody. So now we've got the tuners on. Um, and you're going to need to drill and put the tuner screws in place. Um, we can do that in a second. I just brought my tools back from my dad and stepmom's place where I've been making car's bus shelter lean to summer shelter thing where she can wheel him out into the garden and leave him there it's a shame about all these um, um holes that the finish is incredibly flaky so 
Um, I don't know what the view, sorry, the view is terrible right now. <sighs> uh, yeah, the, the view is, the view is, um, yeah, you can sort of see what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, the, the finish is very flaky, so it breaks incredibly easily around the, the old screw holes, but we shall, we shall see. Um, sort of difficult to judge exactly where to put these. It's a curved, um, it's a curved headstock, so it's always tempts you to put it on a bit of a curve as well. Follow the curve, I say. I'm just going to stand this up and have a quick eyeball at it. I see, even though that's correct, it still doesn't feel quite right to follow the curve quite as extremely as that. I'm going to go with that. Oh, here it is. Right. He says, checking the camera again. Oh, look. So what I'm going to get is the drill. And I'm going to, uh, if I can find where it's gone, I'm going to load up my mini drill bit with the guide, the guide on it. Oh, I've got, what have I got here? Oh, I've got this roof stuff bitumen on my, on my uh, drill, where I sort of rammed it into the roof. Onduline, or whatever it's called. Onduline, onduline. Onduline sounds like a country and western substance. So what I'm gonna do is drill pilots first with a one millimeter jobby and then widen it slightly. To make sure we don't have too tight a fit and that's the one thing we don't want is a very tight uh, fit tuna screw so just getting a, a bit wider at the top there not all the way just to help the fit along okay so make sure should we get should we get yeah let's get this screwdriver thing here i might put the lights on in a minute so here we have nice new screws tuna screws some of them being to tighten up from the other side with the uh, adjustable spanner and then at that point we're on to restringing with the original sacrificial strings we're basically back at the beginning a few days late um, so I'm gonna get stuck into the whole overall setup tonight get it hopefully finished tonight um, and then after that we're I've got three guitars to send away first thing after the bank holiday and then we're on to a couple of new ones coming in during the week but number one on the list then becomes Adam's purple jazz master which is been sitting out there Oh, uh, it's waiting for a buffing. Aha, thinks to self, must go out and buff that. I've got the buffer set up because I just did this headstock. So I knew there was something else I was gonna do with the buffer set up. That's an interesting screw with a great big blob on the end, thankfully. Oh no, there's two of them like that. Uh-oh, chopped an end bit off. That's fine. Thank you, Wilkinson. Right. Yeah, so the Jazzmaster will be the next main main one on the bench. And uh, it's all, it's sprayed with, it's been color sprayed. And then I've done the uh, clear coat, which is again, probably the first proper spray job with that system. So I guess this makes this one and the second one. So yeah, I've sprayed the Purple Jazz Master with car spray first, followed by uh, the Morel's clear coat second. And after that, we'll be, um, where's my wires? I've got the power wire going all the way across here. And I still don't quite know where I am view wise oh yeah uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Is that tight? Yeah. Right. So, setup time. Fret leveling setup. Now, you can see that I'm, I've got a tunomatic bridge in front of me. Oh, yes. So, do we suspect there are going to be some shenanigans with this little thing? Oh, yes. Have I ever managed to get away without there being some shenanigans? No, no. Well, let's see what, what becomes of it. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, what am I going to do? How much have we done? I can't remember where we got to beforehand. Um, I think I did the, I did the sort of checks. Yeah, here we go. I did all the checks. So I don't need to do those again. So I can go straight into getting ready to level these frets. And for that, I will, before I even go any further, I'm going to mark a paint over the, or permanent marker over the frets so that once we get the strings on, we can kind of get straight into leveling mode. So the aim of this, as for, as for pretty much all of my customers, for various reasons, is a very low light action. And, you know, I, I sometimes get some criticism on YouTube about, uh, you know, some people saying that the, the actions I may choose in inverted commas, you know, are ridiculously, unrealistically low, and that nobody with half a, you know, no good, decent player would play with that sort of action. And actually, the, the truth is, that isn't the truth, because um, I have, I have a lot of people who contact me have very particular reasons for wanting a low action. And, and a lot of that, quite a bit of that, will have to do with um, various kind of uh, health issues and injuries. Um, so, you know, it may be that the person who's making the criticism uh, doesn't play with that kind of action. Um, but that's just them. Unfortunately, sometimes they don't seem to be very empathetic towards other people and the circumstances they find themselves in. So I'm just going to lie that on there because I want to get the... I'll put these on, but I really want to wait to tighten up the middle ones before I go anywhere. Um, I'm also trying to make sure that the loose bits on these strings don't jump, uh, scratch into the... Uh, new finish because that would be a shame so as soon as I've got them in place I'm going to cut off the excess so we can't have any scratch injuries now this one is a bit too far through there's not enough wound, wound on so let's add a bit more yeah so you know the truth is a lot of people who contact me have have health issues and need a very low action you know they're not and they're not world famous guitarists frankly you know they are they are guys of you know more senior years perhaps who a lot of times have got back into playing um you know something they've kind of always wanted to do uh, or you know left for many years of their lives and rediscovered um the joy of the, the desire to play the guitar in later life and uh you know many of them have um you know, sort of arthritis issues, um, different, you know, hand strength problem issues. And they want more than anything else to permit them to do this and to have some fun in their own homes. They want a guitar that's unusually low light action and easy to play. And you know something, I will not make an apology for providing them with that if, you know, even if it doesn't suit with your idea of what a professional guitarist should want for an action. Because, you know, that's a bit unempathetic and a bit inhuman to map what you think's right onto somebody else. So, yes, it is a very low action. Um, yes, uh, it does come with its own challenges. One of which, as I've mentioned before, uh, is that as, as the lower you go, the less wiggle room you've got for climate change or environmental changes um, in your in the in the neck of your guitar and so you can all it takes is a, a little bit of a humidity change and suddenly your clearance is gone and you've got buzz back and that's one of the downsides or the you know one of the 
drawbacks of choosing low playing actions. But you know what? My customers still want the lowest, lightest possible so they can get back into playing. And that's what I aim to give them without judgment. Um, you know, I've got, I've got some guitars that I pick up that have fairly high actions and I just love them for what they are. You know, they've got a character and I will play them. I don't, I don't have the lowest possible action on every single one of my guitars um, as a combination, but more often than not, I will play with a very low action because I'm not a, a great slugger, you know, I'm not crashing out chords uh, all the time. Um, and actually, even when I have been, uh, the action I choose for my instruments has always coped with that perfectly well. Okay, so we have everything in place, everything sort of slack at the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dial up the, and think where I put the, nah, the, what do you call it, screwdriver, which is somewhere. Where do I can find it? Now I'm going to wind up the action on both sides of the bridge, get it to a um, close to, or to begin with, approximately where I want it. And then I will also make ready with my adjustable nut, 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 and I will wind that up at this end to give me a starter action. Um, there we go, up you come. Okay, so we're starting to get playing action. Now I'll just double check the action here. So I know I'm aiming for 1.5 on this end here. I mean, that is what I do like the Trinomatic 4 is that it's just two points of adjustment. I mean, that's on the plus side, right? But on the downside, it's fiddly. And when you come to intonate, it'll very, very often make you have to take it all apart to reach intonation. Right, so I'm going to get this into pitch. I'm not going to do bendy things just now because I don't want to take the black marker off the uh, frets because I want to I want that to be there while I do the leveling bit. Let's just check the nut. Okay, the nut's sitting on the shelf right at both ends. That's good. Double check the last fret action. Now I'm going to put the big lights on. Okay, we're just on over over 1.5 mil, so we'll just dial it down a tiny fraction. And we're barely on 1.2 on that end there. So it's a matter of getting this now roughly to, to pitch, just for the tension more than anything else. And we'll be ready to level. Lovely. Okay, let's put the lights on and the heat off. Lights, cameras, reactions. Okay, so let's just check again for the relief. Okay, we're good. What should we do? Should we do that? Let's have some brand spanking new. Paper. Let's use the 
U channel, Stumac U channel thingamajig. Um, the thing by the name of truss rod, that's the one. Um, oops. Um, here we go. U, U channel, U channel if you want to. Right, U channel. Here we go. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. So we use those nuts. Oh, hey, use the nuts. Let's see what's the view. Yeah, it's not a bad view. Use the nuts um, to make the three digital points of measurement for this fingerboard. And I adjust the truss rod according to these three points. So I use them to uh, to sample this curve, I suppose is technically a correct way of putting it. And when I've got the curve right, like there, I can now remove the, um, oh, I'll tell you, I'm going to do, just going to put a little bits of tape on here. Um, just to hold this thing from, from scratching on there. Take that off and then run that against there. And I'll do it on the other side when the time is right. So we knock off the E and then we get ready to do the leveling. And here we go. Leveling to the um, to the curve in the neck. I'm just going to dial in these pickups a little bit more just to take them out of harm's way. Should be pretty good as is, but it doesn't hurt. Okay, so I'm going to use the banana, as I call it, to level the E track, and then I'm going to stop and have a quick look. And it's telling me that I'm cutting everything this end here, missing that one there, possibly, possibly missing that one, the low spot there, these two. Cutting, cutting, cutting more, cutting more, cutting more, missing those there. So two little low spots in this whole deal. And as you may remember me saying in many other videos, the low spots are what dictate, oh my goodness, they're tidying up downstairs in the workshop. Uh, the low spots dictate what's possible. So we're working to the low spots as much as we are to the high spots. So having leveled, the first thing I want to know is, um, do all the notes play? They do. And at this point, I can move on because even though technically um, there's still some uneven uh, frets on, in that mix, they're not impacting on the playing of the guitar. Now, this may be a different matter when we come to the G track because that's the G track is where you get choke outs on the high note bends. And the reason you do is because of the geometry of the curved neck radius. Um, by definition, it, it forces the string to rise up a hill and then back down a hill to its anchor point. Um, and that's a, that's a difficult one because it takes away the clearance that you're, the tiny amount of clearance that your strings need to bend across uh, from the E into that track. So again, the first thing I do is check each note's playability. And then it's good. Pretty good. I think we should be all right. Let's go across into the G now. Oh, we have to calibrate it first. God, what am I doing? So, so we'll recalibrate for the G track. And that's probably just a little bit over curved now. times have I used those little brass feet? I've had them for six or seven years now and used them 
every other day in all of that time. Amazing. So now this is just leveling out the G track <coughs> and uh, seeing a couple of flat, uh, flatter spots up here or higher spots up here, which is good. Not all the way across, just, just in a little cluster there. Um, now we put this back on and then the idea is to play all the notes in the G track. A little bit of sort of what I would call a fret slap in that G train, G track. I'm just going to double check the calibration to be precise. Mm. And then I'm going to just go and level a little bit more in there. That's good. Very gently level all the way across because this is this tells me there's just a little bit of lack of space for the strings to move so I'm going to give it some sort of general attention create open up a little bit of space that the strings need to play without that little bit of buzz now this is 400 grit uh, sandpaper so it's very mild or relatively mild so it might look like a lot of leveling but it's uh, it's absolutely nothing compared to one of those commercial fret leveling files which run on you know like 50 grit better see that that cleared up the fret slap that all over buzz um, it's not caused by individual high notes it's caused by a slight overall unevenness um, in the neck profile which causes or takes away the, that little bit of space we need for the strings to move in and it's very very subtle but it works amazingly well we're going to do the same approach to the d and again i quite expect the d to be presenting us with some fret slap because it tends to be from this point downwards onto the thicker strings that you get what i call fret slap um, fret buzz is caused by individual high or low frets or points on the frets um, and that tends to manifest as a buzzing problem in a very specific area uh, and it tends to be played out on one or two frets but no more. When you get an all over sort of what I call the slap, uh, all over buzz, it tends to be the lack of um, lack of space in the whole in the whole curve for the strings to move the way they want tiny bit there but been really picky and i'm just going to give that a little bit of extra attention incredibly picky of course like i said the downside of this is that if we were to so much as step outside to somewhere where there's a slightly different humidity, um, then that clearance, we're so low that that clearance can disappear in a split second. And so it can cost us and we can return to buzzing, uh, unfortunately quite quickly. But so what we're aiming for is a very low start point action that we can always bring the guitar uh, bring the action up from but I, I can then say to my customer that I've lowered it um, I've set it at the lowest possible action I've leveled it for this 1.5 1.2 action and uh, the only time that changes uh, can change is when uh, like I say the environment environmental conditions change and um, the one thing that will often is likely to change at that point is the curvature of the neck because the neck itself straightens out or bends a bit more depending on its relative the, the effects of temperature or the effects of humidity so if that happens then well not, not that happen that will happen throughout the year and one of the things that's very important is that I say more and more now that customers need to feel 
need to make sure they're confident to make adjustments to their um, guitars next throughout the year. And I think that's quite a challenge because a lot of customers think or feel quite understandably that they're sending the guitar to me because they don't want to uh, get stuck into that stuff. Maybe because they've been made to believe Maybe they, they've been frightened and made to believe that they can do some damage and so on. Um, and so quite a lot of people are reticent, reticent, hesitant, you know what I mean, um, reluctant to uh, make adjustments. But actually the truth is you have to, you have to learn to do it because you, you have to be confident doing it because you will need to do it throughout the year. Um, unless you want to be slave to, uh, you know, taking it to a luthier every time the wind changes. So I, I strongly recommend having it leveled like this. The setup I'm doing is irreversible in the sense that, that it will always level the frets. And that's a good thing about it. Um, and that can only be done this way. Um, but the, the thing I strongly recommend is that people get comfortable making adjustments so that they can adjust throughout the year when changes do will happen to the, the guitar's neck. Okay. Okay, there's a little bit of uh, it's doing the same thing in a way, um, but that's that's slightly choking out in what I would call the B track. So let me do a little tiny bit more in the B track. It's very rare that you get that happening on the backwards, but occasionally you do, and and um, it's always good to just take care of that if you have the opportunity to do it. Not often that anybody bends a note like that, but just in case you want to, it's worth taking care of the underlying unevenness that's getting in the way of that, because that's all it is. So that, that means running into the B track up here and giving it a bit of welly right at the top here. To take care of slight unevenness right up at the top and once we've done that that downwards bend note will, will probably be taken care of can't even remember where it... there you go done okay and you can see my fingers have gone black so that is the fret leveling part done all taken care of now have the guitar set at the lowest possible action realistically you can't get much lower than this um and it would be a it would be in a kind of what they call it a thingy of diminishing returns if you try um so i don't I keep it at that so i'm going to put away the front leveling and the bar right over there and so we're now going to remove the strings and again when you've got this adjustable nut on it's always good to Take the strings from the outside inwards leaving the two center ones on last <coughs> till the last and the same when you're restringing is put the center ones on first to hold the adjustable nut insert down and then finally take the center ones off and that will stop the the uh, nut insert springing out and jumping across the room should it be inclined to do so not always not always the case that it will these are very snug fitting these uh 3D printed ones, but um, it's always good to kind of follow that routine just to be on the safe side. Okay, these strings have done their sacrificial duty, so they're coming off and going in the bin. So the next part of this setup is I'm going to um, re-profile, re-crown re the frets here. This camera angle's still good. Get rid of those leftover bits of the machine head bits here, tuner end, get all these away and then, okay, um, just gently remove the dust, okay, 
So next part is we get the pen and we draw all over these frets again. Uh, we're going to use a crowning file to reshape the frets so that we take off any flat spots that we've put on it through the fret leveling process um, and return the frets to the correct arch shape. Um, so this is a good tool for that. I use it in combination with <coughs> a wire brush just to keep it declogged as we go. Um, these are, I would call them medium jumbo frets. I'm not going to start with the jumbo side of this. Okay. So I work the fret on that. Basically the way I describe it is it rounds off the shoulder of the flat spot and brings that inwards towards the centre and the aim here is to stop filing and leave a little thin, thin as possible line of marker pen down the centre of the fret. Um, and when you do that, you, you sort of can be fairly sure that you've reshaped the uh, fret without taking it any lower than it originally was. And that's what the little black line of marker pen is for. So as a guide so that you don't, you don't continue taking it lower, which would of course defeat the object of having leveled it in the first place. So you can see that there are some areas where we have to take down a high spot or a single high fret, or a fret that's much higher than the others, and, and you'll notice that you end up spending quite a bit more time working on that one. Like here, so that was an, that fret on its own stood out. This one as well, and there's a couple here that need that extra attention. But even so, it's not a huge long length of time, and, it, and you get used to it over time. Uh, you get to recognise when something had to be really hammered hard to get it level. And this one, whoops, this one's a bit more, but not too much. So a cluster right here, of high ones, that needed attention. So once I've done this, the next part of it is to um, mask off all the uh, fingerboard and then polish out these frets that are reshaped uh, out to a plain shine. And then we've got nice, properly shined up frets um, ready to restring and play. So the, the, the precision part of the, the setup is really done. Um, it's, it's done in, in getting the nut, fitting the precision for the custom adjustable nut. Um, the great thing about that nut is that it, it, it achieves a couple of things. The first thing is that we can set the first fret action as low as we like, and the lower the better, as long as the guitar plays. Um, and the other thing is, uh, it because it's a factory made tusk nut anyway, it has the low friction coefficient um, and it will stop, prevent the uh, strings from getting friction, dragged by friction. So that the, uh, once, once we've, as long as we stretch the strings out thoroughly, the guitar will play and stay in tune very well from this point onwards. Okay, so I'm just gonna wipe off some of the dust here now, um, bulk of it. We'll give it all a one over clean in a minute. Um, so the next bit is the masking tape deal and polish out. So that's a bit of a, a long drawn out boring process, which I almost always go off camera for. It's, it's on some videos, but um, so I just end up basically start with full thick, full width tape uh, onto the fingerboard and end up cutting thin strips to get all the way up to the end because obviously we need the frets to stick through. Um, you can buy custom made, special made guitar tape for this, but it's expensive. Um, or it's more expensive than this, that's for sure. Uh, but this is essential to protect the fingerboard from the sanding and <coughs> polishing process. So I go through with uh, the, I suppose the um, the paper that we've done the leveling with was 400 grit. Um, the file for the 
crowning was supposedly 300 grit. And so I go from three to 400 grit-ish marks on here. Uh, I go with 400 grit paper, then to 600, then to 1,000, then to 1,500, and so on and so on. So I'm just gonna hang this up while I cut the rest of the paper ready. So I'm gonna put the out of the way and I'll come back when that's done, when we're polished out and ready to restring and I'll give a bit of a clean up. So see you in a minute. We are ready, polished out, everything's ready to go with the new strings. Here we go. So, important stage of the process. These black guitars, by the way, um, get so dirty, so dusty very quickly. Impossible to keep them clean. So I'm just um, I'm putting the strings on first and I'm going to lock down the D and the G, first of all, out of all of them. Just to keep everything, or keep the uh, adjustable nut in place. <laughs> Pull back one whole fret's worth, hold the string taut, direct the loose string underneath the taut string and the second time round direct the taut string underneath the loose string and then as it comes round cut off the excess there we have a nicely anchored nut now I'll do the G now I'll put the other two on and go back to the low E so at this point in the game what we're looking to do is to string up as lightly as possible so as not to store a load of slack on the posts, which we don't want. But we also want enough on there to hold it tightly. And then we need to be able to um, stretch out the strings. That'll be the next most important thing. And once we stretch the strings out, then it'll be a matter of checking and adjusting the intonation and it's at this point you'll see me going crazy if I have to take the bridge apart because uh, it won't intonate properly which sometimes is what has to happen with Les Paul style guitars. Okay but I'm hoping that isn't going to be the case here. So from the beginning, I think I mentioned tuning stability is down to two things, your nut slots and your slack in your strings, the unreleased slack in your strings. And so we've taken care of the nut slots, first of all, by using the plus adjustable nut. And so that allows us to set an ideal low action down at the first fret, which uh, prevents the uh, some of the common sharp, or the notes playing sharp near the nut, which you get, which you will always get if the first fret action is too high. That's um, done away with. And uh, we'll also, by having a low first fret action, we'll also um, have a light, easy to play guitar down at this end. So it means chords and notes down by the nut will be easy to play. Um, and also because it's made of tusk, we will have the advantage of the lubricated, self-lubricated PTFE mm -hmm. substance that makes tusk so good at um, holding tune. So we've taken care of, by taking, by fitting the adjustable nut, we've given ourselves the best possible chance to, um, to fix all of those problems. That's half of the tuning equation. The other half is the amount of unreleased slack in your strings. And um, we have also, um, we will now take care of that part of the, the deal by stretching the strings out fully 
prior to playing. And this is something that people genuinely don't do enough of. Um, it's always a common misconception, misconception that you can just give them a bit of a tug and everything's done and that'll be it and they'll stay in tune. But they won't. They hold the slack for a long time and it will continue to go out of tune uh, until it's good and ready to give up the, the rest of that slack that's stored in the either in the strings themselves or in the coils that are around the uh, the tuning post so there's no way around it other than to stretch the slack out and once we've done that what you find is that and taking care of the nut ends up with beautifully stable tuning um, and it's worth doing and it's worth putting the effort into so in a minute you'll see me start to stretch the strings out now stretching strings vigorously does run a small risk of breaking high E strings um, but I think it's worth the effort to get your strings to stay in tune because as I said probably earlier on um, one of the things I learned in my later life as I got older is that the guitar that plays and stays in tune becomes the guitar that I reach for, not the expensive one or the one that looks cool or all those other qualities. I want the one that's going to stay in tune, that's going to play in tune when I take it down from the peg, it's going to stay in tune while I play it and after I've played it. So to get that, that's why I've spent my time in the last few years focusing on the, the nut and the slack in the strings, amongst other things. Um, to make sure that we get uh, we get tuning stability, good tuning stability. Okay, so I'm going to raise up the bridge again because we've wound these down whilst cleaning the hole of the guitar. So I'm just going to re-tweak the action to where I want it. loose that won't take it down then we'll go for the first tuning we'll check the action again okay so the nut, the nut is, needs adjusting okay. uh, where's my tuning fork here it is Okay, before I go any more stretching, I'm just going to double, ch triple check the action. Get that right. Um, and then we'll go on to the stretching part from there. So that's a good thing about the tuning mat tuning matic bridge. It does allow me to make the, these adjustments pretty quickly um, rather than running over all the individual saddles. But it has its downsides. Okay. So... What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the strings and we're going to stretch them by pushing and pulling them or pushing them thumb and forefinger. I'm going to give them a pretty good strong tug to get the slack out of them. And once we've done that a few times, we'll be getting close to tuning stability. Um, if I break a high E string, it's usually on the nine sets that I break it, these are tens. If I break a high E, then I will replace that and at the cost of a pack of strings, it's the way it has to be. So now we such a low action. Wow.
So I'm going to give it some big bends, um, some big tugging bends. This will get gross amounts of detuning out of the whole string train. Um, this is often where the E string breaks. <laughs> um, also, this kind of pulling is where quite often uh, strings that have been put on with locking tuners break. See how close we are? Um, if they break, it's if the they break because of the locking tuner um, business. It's because the locking tuner crimps the string in order to hold it. It's a very um, crude way of retaining or keeping a piece of wire in place, and it half destroys it to to lock it down. That leads it to break when you do some big strong pulls, pull ups like I just did. But um, I'm not. These don't have locking tuners. These are what they call easy lock tuners, which I don't use in the easy lock fashion. I use them because they're good quality and they're 19 to 1 gear ratio, which makes them nice and smooth for uh, tuning. Let's check the tuning again after that little stretch. Almost solid there. that that's now tuning stable that's ready to go now the fun part is the intonation part and this is the bit that sometimes leaves me tearing my hair out in despair but it's not going to be like that today because after all the trouble with the nut this guitar is really definitely going to reward me with intonating easily and beautifully simply isn't it Yes, Sam, that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, I don't know what you can see there, but let's have a quick look through my... Oh, yeah, you can see the tuner. Good. Tuner on. Volume up. Treble the full on. That's on the mark. The E is a fraction sharp, and the, so is the B. Uh, okay, so I'm going to pull back the E and the B a tiny little amount, but not lot, not lot. Oop, go the right way. Come back you, that little bit. Come back you, that little bit. Come back you, that little bit. Let's see where we are. There we have it. Thankfully, I'm very pleased with you, Mr. Vintage, that you didn't mess me around this time and that you gave me an easy to intonate uh, bridge. Thank you. I could really have done without that last minute taking everything apart, malarkey, that we have to do sometimes. So, great. Let's just ra ra raise these pickups a little bit. We're basically going up to actually needs to be 
just about three millimeters maximum or about three millimeters below the line so below the lowest fretted wire and that's about how we're at it there we go Okay, so very, very low first fret action can be adjusted with a little key that's now going to be stuck to the... Uh... Whoa, Mr. Magnet. I'll stick that to there, like that, so it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, the hex key. That's it, folks. That's the B100 ready to go out on Tuesday. And it's going to go into the lovely padded bag, um, along with its spare parts, which I shall put together. Radio, there we go. Thanks for watching. Sorry, it was a bit of a disjointed one. Um, I'm going to clean it when I get home again with a last ditch polish to get the dust office, office, dust office, off it before it goes. But that's a beautiful low action. Saved from a catastrophe early on, thanks to the nut, but we're ready to go. <laughs>